Hello all. Um, I wanted to share with you all another book. Now, there's there's two books that I've been wanting to talk to people about, and they relate to a pretty big theme. And what that is is the way that the masculine and feminine roles in society have changed uh, pretty dramatically, perhaps most in the past you know, for the past century. They're really changing big time. And and you could say we're transitioning out of a patriarchal uh, dominance. You know, we, we've had a patriarchal dominance within at least Western culture and probably most most global culture for millennia now. And um, we're transitioning away from that into what you know, I would hope would be a more balanced uh, uh, expression of uh, the, the masculine and the feminine in society. Now, as that happens, as that happens, there's there's kind of a, an uneasiness and a an unbalance because we've had these strong themes of patriarchal dominance for so long that um, it can feel. Uh, upsetting, uh, of course, liberating for women, and uh, perhaps unsettling for men who who not are are having to find new roles as women assume more power, and and all these relationships are kind of in flux. So the old the old patterns are not really working anymore, and something new is being created, really as as in our present day it's happening. So. Um, this, the two books I want to talk about deal with this, and uh, it's it's a powerful phenomenon. You know, much has been written about it, but the first book I want to mention is called The Grail Legend. The Grail Legend. Let's see if I can do it so you can see it. Um, so this book was written by Emma Jung. And Marie Louise von Franz. Now, Emma Jung was the wife of Carl Jung, of uh, psychiatric and psychotherapeutic fame. You know, Carl Jung is a genius who who is a strong uh, a strong influence in, in my uh, uh, my interpretation of the world. He's just a, a, an amazing, amazing genius. Um, and his wife wrote this book. She spent most of her life writing this book. She was a master of the Grail legend. And uh, she died before she was able to finish the book. So Marie-Louise von Franz, who was perhaps arguably the closest associate of Jung and perhaps the best interpreter of what Jung was trying to convey to us, she finished the book for Jung's wife. After after Jung's wife Emma passed away, uh, Carl Jung asked Marie Louise von Franz to finish the book, and she did. So it's it's quite a book. Um, now, what you what you don't want to uh, fall into the trap of is thinking that this book is just a recounting of the Grail legend. So so the Grail legend, uh, I'm sure most of you are familiar with it, and. And while we're saying this, we might ask ourselves, why does the Grail legend still have uh, life? Why is it still why is it still written about? Why do we still see movies? You know, Excalibur, I guess, was in the 80s, the 90s. That's a great film on the Grail legend. Um, but they still do movies on it. I think uh, uh, Richard Gere did one a few years back. You know, so it's still even Monty Python. You know, that's a comical rendition of the Grail legend. But what what is this thing? This you know the Grail legend. Uh, it, it first appeared references to it and and uh, accounts of it. There, there's a couple of different versions, but they first started to pop up around the end of the first millennium after Christ. So what is it about this story that bubbled up at that time? And what is it about this story that we still refer to it today and it still speaks to us in some perhaps unconscious way. Now, there's a lot in this book, and it's pretty intense. Um, there's no way you're going to 
assimilate it by reading it once, and it's not the kind of book you can just just plow through. Um, this is the kind of thing where you kind of read a paragraph, you go back and read it again. And at least at least for me, um, it takes a while to assimilate this kind of stuff. Whenever you're working with uh, symbolic uh, works, there takes there's a kind of um, absorption that occurs, and you can't just read it like you're reading a, a laundry list. You know, you've got to really absorb this stuff. Uh, I, I need to read this again. I've only really read it once, and um, I want to go through it again. It's really rich. There's just so much in it. But what I want to ask you, I want to ask you a question, and then I'm going to come back a little bit later and, and suggest what I think the answer is. And the question is this. What's the significance of this grail? What does this mean? So, you know, I'll read you this little blurb on the back here. Um, the Holy Grail and its quest is a legend that has had a powerful impact on our civilization and culture. The Grail itself is an ancient Celtic symbol of plenty, as well as a Christian symbol of redemption and eternal life, the chalice that caught the blood of the crucified Christ. The story of the Grail sheds profound light on man's search for the supreme value of life, for that which makes life most meaningful. Now, what I want to ask you is, what do you think this grail symbolizes? So this grail, or cup, right? It's just, it's a cup, and it has uh, the blood of Christ in it. What, is, what's, what could be some of the symbolic references that are implied by a cup filled with liquid? I'm going to come back to that, um, but I want to suggest a few other things to you. You know, uh, we have in the West a very strong influence from uh, what what are commonly referred to as Judeo-Christian principles. And and I would I would extend that and I would say Judeo-Christian and Islamic principles essentially come from the same source. And that source is uh, has a very strong patriarchal element. Okay, very strong patriarchal element. All you got to do is read the Old Testament, and you'll see how how true that is. So there's a strong patriarchal element, and of course those are not the only religions that have strong patriarchal elements. But I'm just saying for the purposes of the discussion of this book, uh, that's extremely relevant. And uh, and it could be argued that the the dominance of patriarchy within Judeo Christian and Islamic religions is a more severe and a more strong emphasis of patriarchal dynamic than can be found in some of the other religions. For example, you know, within Hinduism, there is a strong uh, patriarchal dynamic. You can find that in certain aspects of the culture, but you also find a high degree of uh, appreciation for the feminine, the, the divine feminine in the form of goddesses and that sort of thing. Right? And I think in the East in general, there's a more easy acceptance of the notion that God is not uh, limited to one gender. Right? And, I, and I, I put that to, I'd love to hear Christians' response to this. You know, we, we, you know in, in a Christ, Judeo-Christian or Islamic um, frame of reference, we tend to automatically assign a masculine gender to God. And I wonder how... Uh, how accurate that can be, <laughs> you know. So, uh, you know, I for me, it, it, it's pretty clear that uh, the divine has both masculine and feminine elements in equal measure, neither one dominating. And really, perhaps even making that distinction at all is probably pretty silly, you know. Uh, in other words, masculine, feminine are dynamics. That exists within our immediate frame of reference in this world, and it it might be very possible that masculine and feminine have very little relevance in um, transcendental aspects of of what the source of all this is. You know, i.e., God, divinity, uh, uh, the universal energy. Uh, uh, you know, a, a scientist might call it probability. <laughs> you know. All these different languages, we, uh, you know, different words we use to describe that which cannot be defined. So anyway, uh, so so having having said that, having suggested that that there's this strong patriarchal 
patriarchal dynamic within Judeo-Christian and Islamic traditions, um, what might that mean? What might that mean? Let's say, let's let's suppose that in in, the, in its truest sense, the divine does transcend gender association, and let's say that that was something that was missing in the the early development of of uh, Christian religion. Let's say there was not enough feminine. And, you know, the Catholic Church is an interesting uh, reference here because, you know, within the Catholic Church we have this uh, cult of, of Mary, the mother. And so many uh, fundamental Christians take, uh, take umbrage at the fact that the Catholics have these statues of Mary. And what's all this about? What do you, what do you have a statue of Mary? Jesus is God. Well, you know, one way to look at this statue of Mary is that, uh, you know, humans recognize it at an intuitive level that the divine is more than masculine and for some of us you know at the at the ego level for some of us it's uh, easier for us to associate with a masculine God and for others of us it's easier to associate with a feminine God whether some some men prefer a, a feminine divinity some women prefer a masculine divinity and vice versa so anyway I think Catholicism is interesting in that it it couldn't quite totally uh, separate the, the the goddess out, and you could say that Mary is the representation of goddess. Now, of course, the Catholic Church is going to say, well, Mary's not God. Uh, Mary was simply a vehicle through which God was born, and they'll get into you know dialectics about about all this. But from a from a kind of grand perspective, I think one has to admit that there's a strong appreciation for the feminine within the Catholic Church. So, in any event, where is this all going? Um, the, the point is, despite that, despite that uh, appreciation of the feminine within the Catholic Church, uh, most Christian religions, including Catholics and uh, you know, uh, Jews and Muslims, uh, have a strong patriarchal component within their religion that I think uh, to some extent, excludes the feminine. And so, what if this grail legend, this grail legend that pops up in uh, a Christian West around a thousand years after Christ, is trying in an unconscious way to address this issue of the missing feminine? And um, and what if we're still doing it now? And, and what if that's why this story still has relevance? And I'll ask you, is it possible that a cup, a cup filled with liquid, is that not very uh, strongly pointing us to the feminine? Right? What is a cup? It holds something. It's a vessel. You know, the feminine, that's, that's associated with the feminine. It's like a womb that can hold something. Liquid, a, a, a vessel that can hold liquid, is, uh, liquid is, has a very feminine connotation. So is it possible that this holy grail, this cup filled with liquid, represents the feminine? And that this, uh, this myth, this myth legend of the holy grail, is an attempt on the part of the unconscious arising around you know a thousand years AD to address this missing piece within Christianity up to that point which was there's a there's an absence of the feminine and it's very interesting that in association with the grail we also have this culture of uh, what is it called uh, with with the knights and the the damsels and this, uh, there, there's a very strong interaction between masculine and feminine around this time. All these stories, they often have strong elements of masculine and feminine interaction, right? The knight rescuing the damsel. Um, the knight performing actions uh, out of a sense of duty or protection for the damsel. The, the, the masculine king, the feminine queen, right? There's, if we have only a king... You could say we don't have a whole system. We have to have the king and the queen, and then we have an even balanced system. And is it possible that this this grail legend 
of King Arthur seeking this grail is actually seeking the feminine. And, and one thing that can help when we look at this is we're not, we're not necessarily only looking at this in terms of one man and, and an external female, but we can also look at men as having a masculine and feminine side and women as having a masculine and feminine side. And as we in this modern society have these dramatic changes occurring within the way uh, individuals identify themselves and how men understand themselves to be men and how they're going to participate in society and how women understand themselves to be women and how they're going to participate in society. And as, as these roles change and, and evolve into something new, there's a balance that's going to be achieved between the masculine and feminine of each man and the masculine and feminine of each woman. Uh, so, I think this is a powerful, powerful way to kind of get you thinking about this. And, you know, it's interesting. You can, you can read something like this, and it kind of, kind of stirs around in your unconscious, and then it can come back out later. Uh, but uh, would love to hear thoughts of anyone uh, interested. I know this can, can make a lot of people's eyes gloss over, you know, if you're not into this, I understand. This is not a nutritional book, uh, but, you know, you could say that, uh, that, that the whole vegan approach, um, it's quite a shift away from a, a, a traditional dietary approach, and, and you could say that it's a, it's a resurgence of the feminine when someone becomes vegan and becomes more conscious of what's happening to the animals, what's happening to the planet. You know, these are, these are caretaking sentiments. They're nurturing sentiments. So, I mean, you could say that the growth and recognition of veganism is an expression of an increased awareness of the feminine within society and a healthy one, right, a healthy one. You know, it's not, I'm not saying here that everything that's happened within the history of patriarchy is evil, um, but it has, it has, there have been lots of evil things that occurred within a patriarchal society. There have been a lot of things that have occurred that have brought us to this point where we have the technological advances that, that we do have. You know, I, I read an interesting thing the other day that, you know, vacuums were probably developed by men. So a lot of these modern conveniences, conveniences that have allowed women to get out of the house and start pursuing their own careers rather than spending all their time cleaning, you could say to some degree came from this, uh, this masculine patriarchal scientific uh, progression. Um, but it did take a long time and, and there's been so much suffering uh, on the part of women over all these millennia due to um, ignorance within patriarchy. We have to acknowledge that. But uh, anyway, would love to hear your thoughts on these issues. Um, I think this stuff's fascinating. I have another book that I'll, I'll share with you uh, perhaps tomorrow that, that I would strongly recommend. So this is uh, The Grail Legend by, uh, by Emma Jung and Marie-Louise von Franz. And I've only just scratched the surface, and I've just kind of shared with you one uh, important principle that I glean from reading this. Uh, you may read this and find that that's not at all what the authors are saying. <laughs> You know, so, so you might read it for yourself. But uh, anyway, I highly recommend it, and uh, thanks for watching. Take care.